catch that? That was DART, a NASA mission which crashed into an asteroid last year to study methods for planetary defense, and, more importantly in my opinion, to avenge the dinosaurs. While you may have heard about DART's 65 million year revenge story, what you may not have heard is it was equipped with ion thrusters, which are a form of electric propulsion. Granted, these thrusters were not the primary propulsion on DART, as test findings indicated higher than expected effects on the spacecraft. However, they act as a backup propulsion system and demonstrate the increasing prevalence of electric propulsion in spaceflight. In contrast to traditional chemical rockets, which propel spacecraft using the energy stored in chemical bonds, electric propulsion accelerates propellant using electric and magnetic fields. As such, electric propulsion devices are much more fuel efficient and thus require less fuel to accomplish a given mission. While there are many different types of electric propulsion, the most widely flown is the hull thruster, which the rest of this video will focus on. Hull thrusters are ring-shaped electric propulsion devices. If we were to look at the thruster from the side and cut it in half, we would see something like this. From this view, we can see the four main features of a hull thruster, the cathode, anode, discharge channel, and magnetic circuit. Either coils or permanent magnets are used to generate a magnetic field, while the cathode and anode are connected to a power source through a circuit, which forms an electric field that points in the axial direction. The operation of a hull thruster can be explained by analogy to a 20th century prison system. First, the cathode emits electrons, or in this case, prisoners, which make their way towards the anode by way of the discharge channel. Once in the discharge channel, the electrons encounter the magnetic field, which due to the specific configuration of our electric and magnetic fields, imprisons them and prevents them from reaching the anode. For prisoners behind bars, neutral gas is injected through the anode and makes its way down the discharge channel. The imprisoned electrons are then put to work, turning the neutral gas into ions through collisions, which are then accelerated by the axial electric field to produce thrust. With their labor through collisions, the electrons gradually earn their freedom and migrate across magnetic field lines until they eventually reach the anode, where they are freed and can rejoin society. However, akin to real life prisoners, the electrons have a habit of performing prison breaks and reach the anode much faster than would be expected by only collisions with other particles. In fact, the electrons cross the magnetic field lines so quickly that models of hall thrusters cannot correctly predict thruster performance without accounting for these prison breaks, which is the problem of so-called anomalous electron transport. Turn to the problem encountered by DART, where the electric propulsion system significantly affected other parts of the spacecraft. This issue shows that if we wanted to fly a spacecraft with hull thrusters, we would need a model to predict how the thruster would affect the spacecraft. The problem with anomalous transport, however, is that since hull thrusters were invented over 60 years ago, nobody has been able to figure out a simplified model for anomalous transport based on the operating conditions of the thruster alone. To use our prisoner analogy, we know the electrons are building tunnels, but we're not quite sure if we should model them using pickaxes or shovels to do so. While we can't predict anomalous transport for a given set of operating conditions, we can set up an experiment to measure thruster operation and then infer the anomalous transport by comparing the model results to experiment. This allows us to calibrate our models of hull thrusters to make predictions based on thruster operation, such as thruster lifetime or the effects of the thruster on the spacecraft. I'm Declan Brick, a PhD student here at University of Michigan's Plasma Dynamics and Electropropulsion Laboratory, or PEPL. My research focuses on how we infer the anomalous transport, which can vary as a function of axial location. This function is known as the anomalous frequency curve, and an example is shown on the plot here. There are a few different measurements we use to infer the anomalous frequency curve, but the gold standard is the ion velocity curve. Traditionally, an engineer will adjust the shape and scale of this curve until the model's ion velocity curve matches the experimental curve. While there are ways to automatically adjust the scale of the curve, the curve shape must be hand-tuned for a given thruster, a method which is both time-consuming and doesn't necessarily guarantee the best possible match. I am researching how computers can shape the anomalous frequency curve. Specifically, we are applying the power of Bayesian inference, which based on the uncertainty in our experiment and how well or poorly one shape of the anomalous frequency curve matches experimental data, proposes a new shape of the curve to try. After trying many different shapes, the computer then finds a statistical best fit to the experimental data. With these best fit profiles, we can then determine how a hall thruster will affect the rest of the spacecraft and ensure that it doesn't interfere with spacecraft operation. This, in turn, enables the most fuel efficient dyno engines, or whatever mission the spacecraft is needed for. If you're curious about the additional work at Pepple, you can check out the other videos on the different types of research we're doing. If you have any questions about this work, you can leave a comment down below. Thanks for watching.